Hello, and welcome back to the Environmental Economics course. The seventh theme of the course uh, uh, concerns in international environmental agreements. So, as, as we know, many of the environmental uh, problems today are transboundary in their nature. A prime example is, of course, the, the global warming and climate change, which is really truly a, a global uh, global um, environmental problem could be considered as a as a as a main main uh, threat today so there are a large number of uh, international uh, international agreements uh, concerning the environment uh, there are several thousands uh, of them in fact uh, uh, consisting of course like like uh, various subsets of countries um, uh, many of them are kind of local in their nature, considering perhaps just two countries or small, small, small number of countries. And then, of course, the they typically the agreements they focus on specific uh, environmental problem. So on this slide, I have a couple of examples of um, of uh, influential uh, agreements or or agreements that are worth noting. Uh, so uh, there are some examples of really successful agreements which have have uh, successfully managed to address the environmental issue. For example, uh, the long range uh, transboundary air pollution convention that was uh, uh, signed in the, in the late seventies and ratified in the early eighties. Uh, another example is the Montreal Protocol uh, with that uh, that relates to the to the ozone layer. So there was the the deplete of the ocean layer was a huge huge issue in the in the late eighties and still early nineties, but with an international agreement, uh, it it has been successfully successfully addressed. Um, here in Finland, uh, Finland has been quite active in the protection of the Baltic Sea from the eutrophication, and there is this uh, Helcom Helsinki Convention that uh, aims to reduce the, the uh, nutrient emissions to the to the baltic sea uh, this is perhaps not uh, not as successful as the previous examples uh, in the sense that uh, eutrophication continues to be a, a major major problem there has been some some uh, decrease in the nutrient pollution but uh, but still the still the eutrophication remains a, a major problem and then of course there is uh, uh, like convention on nuclear safety is of course like obviously important and then uh, then uh, one of the famous examples of um, international environmental agreements is the kyoto protocol which i have referred to also earlier already so kyoto protocol of course concerns the the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to the to the climate change and global warming so let me comment a little bit more on this first one and the last one of these these examples. So firstly, about these um, these kind of um, uh, transboundary air pollution that uh, that was addressed in the in the early early eighties. So this picture illustrates the uh, concentrations of uh, sulfur dioxide. Uh, of a single power plant that, that that is located in Germany, so um, sulfur dioxide is of course um, uh, closely related to the so-called acid rain. So this is this is in some sense um, uh, uh, transboundary pollutant, as you can see in this uh, this map indicated on this slide that this uh, these uh, sulfur dioxide concentrations of just a single power plant in Germany they the the impacts. Uh, affect basically the the entire europe to uh, some sense so i remember in my my uh, childhood and uh, and early youth there was a lot of uh, media attention and the problem of acid rain which was uh, causing uh, for example forest uh, a lot of forest loss in the especially in the central europe uh, and and definitely this this kind of uh, transboundary air pollutants uh, at that time that that was a, a major also health issue so so there was uh, there was then a, 
a, a lot of um, uh, need and also also political will to then then uh, curb down this kind of um, uh, like sulfur dioxide emissions from power plants, but also also traffic that. Uh, and that time there were also also technological solutions, so it would be possible to then um, add some some uh, some filters. For example, in cars, there would be this kind of um, um, they became a mandatory mandatory uh, to 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 have this kind of um, catalyzers installed in in all all new passenger cars, for example. So uh, with this kind of uh, technological solutions, uh, uh, it has been uh, this kind of sulfur dioxide and other other air pollutants such as this uh, have been effectively curtailed, and and uh, this can be seen in that sense as a very very successful example. However, similar kind of uh, technological solutions do not really apply or are, are much more expensive to implement. If we talk about uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which which contribute to the global warming, so in some sense it, it it's perhaps also with hindsight somewhat unfortunate that this kind of there was this kind of relatively cheap uh, possibilities to decrease this kind of more local air pollutants uh, uh, and still continue to to burn fossil fuels for energy use, for example. So uh, so uh, if this kind of um, uh, energy transition uh, would have been already initiated earlier in the in the eighties, perhaps, and also the situation with the with the global warming would be would be better than uh, than it is currently today. So any, anyway, when the, when it concerns this kind of uh, um, international uh, transboundary pollutants, which affect anyway relatively small number of countries. Uh, Many countries, but still, it is kind of more a regional problem. Then it has been has proved uh, uh, possible to possible to address. So, with these kind of experiences of of uh, successful environmental agreements, there was also a lot of optimism in the late nineties when when the international community started to uh, pay more attention to the to the global warming. And climate change, and uh, there was already early nineties uh, United Nations conventions, uh, and this kind of um, uh, frameworks were established. And uh, the most um, ambitious uh, international agreement so far, I, I would say, is the is the famous Kyoto Protocol, uh, which was um, agreed upon in Japan in in uh, late nineteen ninety seven. And in this agreement, uh, the main uh, industrialized countries, so there were 36 uh, uh, rich countries agreeing to cut down emissions uh, relative to the level in, in the year 1990. And, um, and the agreement uh, entered into force in, uh, in 2005 uh, and the first commitment period, so it, actually this kind of emission reductions taking place was... Uh, uh, in 2008 to 2012 and subsequently it was uh, extended to the years uh, 2012 to 2020 this extension is known as uh, Stoha amendment but uh, there was also also a lot of critique uh, already directly uh, when this uh, as soon as this uh, this Kyoto protocol was signed uh, then uh, also many economists uh, criticize the protocol that it's it's very uh, costly and and also very very inefficient uh, and um, probably as a result of this kind of critique uh, uh, not only by economists but also also more broadly there was a lot of political turmoil also so as a result uh, for example the USA the the largest uh, emitter at that time. Uh, the USA signed, but uh, but never actually ratified this Kyoto Protocol. There were also other countries, um, for example, Canada did ratify, but later also also withdrew. Uh, Australia was a long time hesitating, but eventually joined the joined the agreement. Um, so so many large large uh, industrialized countries uh, uh, did not actually follow the the protocol. Uh, 
it in the in the Europe uh, the EU countries uh, signed and ratified and followed this this uh, Kyoto Protocol. So so uh, in the end it turned out very very much uh, EU um, EU driven. Uh, so in of course the EU it, itself is like an international uh, group of of countries. And and this uh, protocol was implemented in the in the EU, for example. Um, after 2020, when this this uh, this uh, second uh, commitment period ended, uh, it has been difficult to to uh, to renew this agreement. Uh, uh, there was Paris Agreement in 2015, but uh, in contrast to the Kyoto Protocol, it did not. Uh, uh, managed to get some some uh, definite uh, binding uh, binding reductions. There was kind of um, uh, expression that uh, that uh, that these uh, signatory countries aim to 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 reduce emissions, but there were not some specific uh, uh, specific targets agreed upon. And of course, in the EU, this there's, uh, there's um, the EU countries have continued to follow this kind of. Uh, definite targets uh, even after this 2020 so there is uh, there is still still a uh, work ahead and of course i should also note that uh, that also uh, countries that uh, have not uh, ratified the agreement like the usa uh, have also not really really continued to increase emissions but uh, but uh, and also in many many uh, specific states of the united states there there are um like, uh, there are emission reduction targets like for example the state of california is is uh, has been relatively advanced in this respect so in the next uh, lesson we then look into what kind of lessons we can gain from game theory concerning the international agreements and uh, one of the questions is uh, why some of the international agreements are very successful while others are more difficult to implement. Thanks for your attention and see you in the next lesson. Bye.